What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel podcast network. She is Abby Schnabel. I'm Noah Hiles, and it is once again time to talk some college sports here on the channel. Abby, we're halfway through training camp. We've been writing about it. We've been podcasting about it. We've been making videos. We've been tweeting or Xing, whatever you want to call it now. <laughs> the season's approaching. Obviously, I've been busy at the pit camp. You've been kind of all over the place. I thought like a good way to attack this episode would be for you to kind of utilize this inside <laughs> presence that I am. No, I'm just kidding. But um, no, I should like, just uh, let me just call Chris Carter real quick. Yeah, Maybe right. That's, that's who you really need. He's already done 30 podcasts today, so he can't do any more. Um, but on a real note, I feel like it's a good thing to kind of just maybe reflect on some perspective. Yeah. I mean, I've had a chance to talk about it on pit mailbags and, and write about it, but there, there are certain observations I feel that can get passed over. So as someone who hasn't had the chance to get out to pit camp yet, uh, fill in for the shoes of everyone else who hasn't got out to pit camp and, you know, ask some questions that you might have just as someone interested in seeing how things are going for the Panthers so far in 2023. It's a, it's a mailbag, except instead of the fans asking the questions, I'm asking the questions. Yeah. And you're not allowed to say no. Ask away. <laughs> okay. Um, the first one I'm curious about, and for the record, getting out to pit camp soon, just been crazy busy with everything else that I've been working on and life. Um, but something that I've been curious about is, you know, I can read about it, but all of your stories have different angles. What are some of your initial, um, impressions? Like who has stood out to you in the six plays that you get, um, every morning or who have the coaches been talking about? Well, for me, um, I feel like there are times where I'm looking at different things than coaches are. Obviously they see the game a lot different than I do. They see a lot more of it than I do too. Um, but I'd say my MVP so far in training camp has been Bub Means. And it should be. I mean, this is a guy who Pitt needs a star receiver. And a lot of people were thinking maybe that could be, could be Kanate Mumfield. But Bub Means, I mean, he came in with his share of hype as well around him. And he didn't, he'll be the first to admit he didn't have a good year last year. And this is a guy, I mean, he changed his number, he changed his hairstyle, and he made some changes to his body. He's put on some weight. He's even faster. He was on Bruce Feldman's top 100 freaks in the country, like athletic freaks. Um, I think he's number 36 on that list. So he's like one of the most athletic players in the country, and, and you've really seen it. Um, Pitt needs to throw the ball better, and they've made an upgrade at quarterback. One thing they didn't really upgrade was their receiver room. They've got younger. They've got less experienced. Uh, and they're looking to replace a guy in Jared Wayne that had one of the most productive seasons in program history. Only 13 players have had a 1,000-yard receiving season. He's one of them. So they need someone to step up. And Bub Means being the, the elder statesman of that receiver room, he's on every highlight tape. He's making big catches. And the thing that I think stands out most to me is his leadership. I was really, I really wanted to pay attention to the receivers today in practice. And Bub runs his route first in every drill. And then afterward, he stands in front of the line and is just paying locked on attention to all of these four freshman receivers that are competing for playing time. And he's coaching them up, arguably coaching them up harder than the receiver coach, the offensive coordinator, the head coach. I mean, he's in their ear and he's not like bullying them or being, you know, a big, bad senior. This guy's invested in their success and he's exactly what that position needed. Um, granted, it still needs a, it needs to turn out on the field. I mean, this guy dropped some passes last year, especially in the beginning of the year. He struggled. But if he can come out and have a, a breakout season the way that I think he's capable of, I mean, that's going to be huge for Pitt because 
passing is going to be what makes or breaks this team. If they can improve through the air, it's going to make the whole team better in return. And it's going to start, I mean, it starts with the quarterback who I've also been impressed with, but Bub means has, has really, really grown. I didn't, I hardly noticed him at all last camp. Um, but I, it's, it's hard to not notice him this camp. And then on the, on the defensive side of the ball, a guy that stands out to me is Sean Fitzsimmons. Uh, I'm not sure how much of Sean Fitzsimmons we'll see this year. Logic would tell you you wouldn't see him at all because there are three sixth-year guys at his position in front of him on the depth chart. But how in front of them – or how how high up on the depth chart are they? Because this guy's still in every conversation you have when you ask about the defensive line. And in the small t- snippets of action that I've seen – He's splitting double teams. He's getting in the backfield. He's he's making plays. And um, I don't know if we're going to see him in the beginning of the season, but I, I wouldn't be shocked by the end of the year if number 55 is lining up as a, as a redshirt freshman on Pitt's defensive line, which it just doesn't happen very often. But I could see that being the case this year. Spin off to that question that I had for you. You know, Pitt's replacing a lot of big time players um, from last season and has has a lot of youth, as you have mentioned. Who are some of these young guys that have uh, stood out? You, I mean, you mentioned Bum Means as as a older guy, ready to stand out. But any true freshmen standing out, or even any just younger guys who haven't really gotten to see the field yet? Yeah, Fitzsimmons is one. Um, two other guys I want to really talk about. Ryan Bear is someone that I'm really, really impressed with in the sense where earlier today in practice, Wednesday in practice, um, after the team stretches, you know, they have a little breakdown, like pit on three or whatever. The guy giving the big speech was a red shirt freshman, a guy who's played three games of college football in his life. And he doesn't really even have an official position yet. And that's Ryan Bear. And it's, it's kind of crazy that I think this highly of him. But when you just look at his size, you look at his overall skill set, you, you, you really dive into the quotes that you're given from the offensive line coach, the offensive coordinator. Um, they're, they're very high on this guy. I think he will start either at left tackle or left guard. But, I mean, if this guy starts at left tackle as a redshirt freshman, I mean, the, the sky's the limit here for him. He's a big-time recruit. I think one of the only four stars in Pitt's 2022 recruiting class, or 2021, excuse me, recruiting class. Um, or no, it would have been 2022. My bad. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's just, he's going to be a problem, I think, for opposing defenses. And he has his teammates' respect already. I'm really excited to see how they use him. But I, I wouldn't be shocked coming into next year if he's on some – preseason all ACC lists or things like that. I just think he has a very, very bright future and this could be his breakout season. Um, and then the other freshman he's been the talk of camp is Kenny Johnson. This, this young receiver from Dallas town, Pennsylvania, the MVP of the big 33 game. He didn't arrive early to camp like Lamar Seymour and Israel Polk did. But I mean, this, this guy is, Every day you hear someone talking about him, be it a fellow receiver, a quarterback, a coach, just other people who are able to observe him. He just seems to be one of those, every now and then, Pitt finds that that three-star guy who they don't really need much development. They just show up and, and make plays. And, you know, they look pretty good their freshman year, but then their sophomore year, they're like kind of amazing. I think Kenny Johnson could end up being that guy. So I, I, it felt like last year this was such an older team because there were so many guys using that COVID year or that were just redshirt seniors, where this year there is a little bit more of a younger presence to it, and it's, it's, a, it's been a lot of fun to cover. That's awesome. Yeah. It's always the young guys. I feel like whenever I was covering Wisconsin, I was always, I always had my eyes on the young guys. Cause you, you just never knew what you were going to get from them. Um, and then, you know, looking forward, like you said, halfway through camp, two weeks away from, from the first game, a little over two weeks, but, uh, 
what are what are some improvements from last season that you've noticed or even from the spring and and what still needs to be improved so improvements one thing that uh frank signetti pointed out he thinks and i and i i I believe him. I haven't necessarily seen it because, again, he's got to watch his team practice more than I have. But he says he's really high on the tight end room, and I can understand why. Uh, tight end is something that's very important to his offense. It was super underutilized last year because the, it, the offense was run by a quarterback that didn't really understand it or wasn't comfortable in it. Um, but this year, with the quarterback that's very familiar with it, I would think the tight end room is going to prosper. prosper, And... I just, I just look at <clears throat> the different options they have. They have a guy like Gavin Bartholomew, who is the prototypical tight end. He can block. He can make plays. We saw last year against Tennessee when he hurdled a guy 30 yards downfield, what he can do with his athleticism. Um, and then behind him, you have Carter Johnson, a, a former defensive tackle that was almost 300 pounds, and he changed his body into being this – kind of like a athletic specimen and he can make plays with his hands, but I look for him to be a big force in the blocking and, and, and in the run game. And then they have this wild card and Malcolm Epps, a guy who was a big time high school prospect. And then he went to Texas and it didn't quite work out there. Then he went to USC and it didn't quite work out there. And I'm not sure how it's going to work here at Pitt. But I know that his skill set, his catch radius, it's six foot six, 250 pounds. That's a weapon that Pitt really hasn't had. And yeah, you can point to the depth chart. You could see like they had someone like Lucas Kroll a couple years ago and stuff like that. But when you see this guy lined up in pads, he just looks different. He, he, he's slimmer. He is someone who can, you could just throw a ball up. You can line him up on someone who's five foot 10. And just say, we're going to throw it up high where this, where this player is not capable of jumping and getting it. We need you to go do that. And he might only have 10 to 12 catches a year, but I would not be shocked if five of them are touchdowns. So there's just a lot to like in that room where tight end was the, kind of another missing piece to this team last year. I think it could be a strength. Um, room for improvement would be safety just because it big shoes to fill. You're replacing two players who are in the NFL now. I mean, everyone talked about the guys before them. Paris Ford, who was a big-time local recruit, and DeMar Hamlin. Obviously, everyone's heard that name. And while those guys were talented, Hill and Hallett were the better duo. By every, by every measurable, unless if you're going by high school recruit prowess, but Hill and Hallett led this team to an ACC championship. Hill and Hallett were both drafted. And their teams were just more successful. They were, they were really, really good players at Pitt. And they made things that weren't difficult or that are very difficult look very easy. And so replacing them both at the same time is tough. Um, you know, you, you, the coaching staff has been very high on Javon uh, McIntyre, uh, I expect him to be one of those two starters. Um, PJ O'Brien seems to be the other guy leading the charge there. And, um, you know, the, they, they've both been with this program. This is their third year. They're familiar with it. We've seen them in flashes. But it's just big shoes to fill. And when you hear week in and week out about how the deep ball is working, well, that, that means – it's working against Pitt's defense. And while, yeah, that's against their corners, if it's a super, you know, consistent deep ball, there should be some help from the, the safeties there. So I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want necessarily they're saying they're – I'm not here to say they're having a horrible camp. I'm just saying that they have big shoes to fill, and um, that seems to be a position where, unlike others – where there, there's a million guys, coaches are lining up to highlight, you have to do a little bit more prying to get information on guys aside from Javon McIntyre in that group. Okay, last one for you, Noah, on, yes. the, on the pit side. How did you feel about your ACC Network cameo today? You know, I've had better ones, if we're being honest. <laughs> uh, as, 
as is the case with most things, Chris Carter stole the show. You can check oh, out. 100%. <laughs> is now meme on our Twitter account. I believe the Post Gazette Sports Twitter account retweeted it too. So that's great. Um, so yeah. Uh, all right. In his great. bright purple shirt. Yes, and his sunglasses, just always looking serious. Yep, that's him. Uh, so that's my buddy. So Abby, uh, I'll take a great interview. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll ask. I, I we always like to cover a little bit of a national perspective as well on this show. The AP poll preseason came out earlier this week. Uh, neither of us had a vote in it, but we both have an opinion. So to, <laughs> to close out the show, I want to ask: Who's someone? Give me your too high of a ranking and too low of a ranking okay. in this year's AP poll. Okay, so for um, too high. I, which is funny because they check in at number 23, but they are too high in my opinion. It's Texas A&M because I don't believe they should be ranked. Um, they had a not a great season last year. I mean, five and seven. I mean, I feel like the only reason they're really on the poll is because they are an SEC team. They have a big brand, but their recruiting wasn't great this year. Didn't get any big pieces. And, and you know, They've recruited a lot, but they aren't winning anything. And, and you can't have both of those things. and uh, Or you can't have recruiting a lot and winning none. Yeah. It, yeah. It, needs, it needs to be a straight line. Win, recruiting a lot, winning a lot. And Texas A&M, just, it, it just doesn't feel like they're um, up to the caliber of other Power 5 teams. And definitely not, in my opinion, in, in the SEC um, and then my two low, number 24, Tulane, um, you know, they're, they're a mid-major, but they went 12-2 and two last year, um, and they have a lot of their pieces back. And so I feel like because they don't necessarily have that power five b- backing them, um, it, it makes the people doubt them a little bit. You know, we see that in – basketball football we see that in every single sport but i feel like Tulane should have been a little bit higher because they have you know had some success especially recently and i think they have the chances to be pretty good this year i like those picks um i'll weigh in on mine before we wrap up the show too high uh i'm gonna pair these two together because they paired themselves together when they were actively trying to destroy the big 12 and that's (laughs) texas and oklahoma um, Texas should be ranked. Texas should not be ranked in the top 15. I don't know how many times we got to do this. Uh, I don't care what their NIL budget is. I don't care what their recruiting prowess is. This team won, I don't know, like it, it, it's season wasn't any more impressive than like Pitts last year. Was it? They took Alabama down to the wire. Cool. Like that's like. Quinn Ewers, big time name, but like, what has he really done? You know, like there, there's, there's a lot of talent there and I'm not saying they're not capable of being a top 10 team or whatever they're ranked or what are they? 11. Yeah. But can we just make them show it? Can we just put them at like 20 and make them earn it once since like <laughs> Vince Young left? Maybe. No. Okay. Um, actually they're pretty good after Vince Young. They had a guy named Colt McCoy, pretty good. But anyway, uh, and then Oklahoma, I mean, aside from brand recognition, what does Oklahoma have to offer? <laughs> uh, and again, not long ago, this, this school was a powerhouse. I get it, but like they're coming off an atrocious year and like, what, I don't know. Like what's the difference between Oklahoma and Miami right now? It's a lot of transfers, a lot of drama, a lot of whatever. Let's see you win. Let's see you win. You know, let's see you win without Lincoln Riley. Like, <laughs> you've done it before him, but year one without him did not look good. No. It did not look good. And granted, yeah, you're, you're forced to replace a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and everything, but, I mean, we'll see. I feel like – they just got the benefit of the doubt because they're they're Oklahoma. Um, yeah, were they even in the coaches' poll? No, yeah, they, <laughs> they weren't. So that answers that. Um, yeah, they they weren't. Were, yeah. So we'll move over, and then for too low, I don't know how much lower I would or yeah, 
yeah, too low. I don't know how much better I would rank this team. Oh, no, Oklahoma is in the coaches' poll. That's my bad. Uh, but anyway, we've moved on from that. They're too low. <laughs> I'm going to go with Washington. I think Washington could win the Pac-12 this year, and that's actually like saying something this year when you look around at the talent in that conference, especially at quarterback, uh, with obviously the returning Heisman winner, with DJ Uyungle at Oregon State, with Cam Rising at Utah again, and just there's there's so many good teams in that in that league. But what Penix brings to the table there, and the receivers that they have, I I, I think that that Washington Huskies team is going to be a problem. Um, so maybe ten, I think, is a little disrespectful to them. I'd probably put them in maybe like. Seven, eight, I don't know. I, I I think they're that good this year. So that would that's be my fu- pick. That's funny because my uh, other two low was Utah. Um, Utah's in the game. same light. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Utah has won the Pac-12 the Pac or two years in a row, pretty solid. Like you said, there's just a lot of talent in the Pac-12 this year. It is. It's um, a really good conference, and I think it's going to be a little bit of a boxing match to the finish, which will be fun. Well, it's going to do what it does every year, and it's going to cannibalize itself, and no one from the conference is going to make the college football playoff because everyone's going to go 10-2, and two and no one's going to go 11-1. and one. So, yep. uh, But that's all we got for this week. Abby, any final thoughts as we wrap things up? Nothing for me. We've, we've hit it all. All right. Love to hear it. I think I'm good on my end as well. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and keep tuning in to all of our coverage on the Post-Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel. Take care. Thank you for checking out this content from Post-Gazette Sports. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Apple Podcast channel for more podcast content. Click below for a special deal of 99 cents for a three-month subscription to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette.